Good evening and welcome to a special News 6 Town Hall Driving Change. I'm Matt Austin and we are serious about getting results and pushing lawmakers to toughen up our texting and driving laws. We are streaming this conversation right now live on ClickOrlando.com, our mobile app and at Facebook.com slash News 6 and we are thankful that you are joining us. This hour we will hear from law enforcement, advocates and lawmakers both for and against our drive for change. We'll also hear from victims and the loved ones who are left behind. Now for me, this is personal. News 6 started investigating how effective or ineffective our current laws are working after my car was slammed into by a distracted driver. Here's a look at my initial call to action back in October, which has seen hundreds of thousands of views on social media. All around Florida, it's a common sight. People daily with their faces buried in a phone driving two-ton bullets. So it should have come as no surprise to me when last month a young man who was texting while driving plowed into the back of my car while I was waiting at a stoplight. This was the result. Now, I can't tell you everything that happened that night because my baby's car seat slammed so violently into the back of my head, it knocked me out, gave me a severe concussion, and 10 staples in my scalp for my troubles. The car totaled. In the emergency room that evening, the OPD officer told me the driver admitted he was texting while driving. So days later, it came as a real shock when I received the police report and saw not only did the other driver not receive a ticket, but the officer didn't even note in the report the young man was texting. This is the reality of cars and cell phones in our state. Some Floridians think texting while driving is just no big deal. And because of the way our laws are written, police officers are almost powerless to stop it. If you're caught glancing at your phone in a hands-free state like, say, Utah, you could be fined up to $750. If you get into an accident in Utah while texting, a driver faces up to 15 years in prison and up to 10 grand in fines. But what about Florida? Because of our state and the way it treats as a secondary offense, a police officer can only write a ticket for texting while driving if a driver is pulled over for another reason entirely. But when police do cite drivers for texting behind the wheel, how much does it cost? Well, in Florida, a first offense earns you a fine of 30 bucks. And that's what happened to me. Even though the officer told me the young man admitted he was texting while driving, the officer didn't see him doing it, and the texting was left out of the report. Here's how absurd it is. It is possible a driver could literally text a selfie to an officer while driving, and because that officer did not witness the violation, you might not even get a ticket. Here at News 6, we pride ourselves on getting results. And over the next legislative session, we're going to be doing just that. It will be our mission to help drive change in Florida's impotent texting laws. And no, it's not because I got hurt. Lots of people are getting hurt. The reason I'm doing this is because of what's normally in my back seat. These three beautiful girls are usually crammed back there. And last month, if the situation were a bit different, they could have buried their dad. And to me, that is simply unacceptable. I'm going to blink, and they will be driving around these same Florida roads with these same dangerous laws unless we do something about it. But to enact change, I will need your help. And I don't want you to help because of me or even because of them. Help because of the little ones in your backseat. If you or your family have been impacted by texting and driving, tell us about it on Facebook. Maybe we can use your story to drive change. And if we collectively make it our mission, our duty to affect change, together we will get results. And that is exactly what we've been doing. If you have a story in which texting while driving has impacted you or your family, we want to hear it. Maybe we can use that story to help drive this change we're looking for. You're watching this webcast right now on ClickOrlando.com or our mobile app or maybe Facebook. But if you're on our uh, mobile app or the website, right on the home page there, you can find the link where you can share your story. We'll also read some of your comments and questions from our Facebook page, facebook.com slash news six. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel. It is a pretty fantastic panel, if I do say so myself, this hour to discuss driving change and some of the challenges that we are facing as we go through this. We are joined, I'm gonna go from left to right here. We have Chief Jeffrey Chudnow of the Oviedo Police Department. Next to him is Brett Raley, the former chief of Winter Park Police Department, still very active in uh, safety community. Sergeant Kim Montez, 
of the Florida Highway Patrol, who I found out just minutes ago is a neighbor of mine. Hey, neighbor, how are you? Uh, we also have Glenn Victor, Director of Public Relations and Marketing at the Florida Safety Council, on the news a lot, preaching stuff just like this. No texting and driving. Alex Smith is the Vice President of Operations with the National Traffic Safety Institute. These are many of the power players we need involved in this and tons of information we're looking forward to getting from you guys. But before we get to our panel, the best place to drive change is in Tallahassee. News 6 reporter Vanessa Ariza has been knocking on lawmakers doors all day long and she joins us live at the state capitol building. Vanessa, it is certainly an uphill battle, isn't it? To say the least, Matt, you have lawmakers who have been pushing for stricter laws for years now. Some have gotten close, but in the end, those bills have not passed. However, this new session, you have a freshman representative. This is very close and very personal to her. She has two bills that she is proposing. She actually, in fact, lost her twin sister in a car accident when they were teenagers as a result of distracted driving. She also lost friends of hers. She herself was in the hospital on a respirator. She tells me that this is why she took this seat. She wants to see that change. She also has supporters who are on her side helping her through this. However, in any political game, you are going to have those who oppose this change. One of those opposers, Senator Bobby Powell, we spoke earlier today. He said, hey, look, I am all about no texting and driving and traffic and driver safety. That being said, he feels as though if there were any changes that it would create more of uh, an effect where it would be uh, targeting minorities who are behind the wheel. He, he doesn't want that control to be taken over. Another reason he said for a minority group to be pulled over. Now there is another group who is on the side who wants to see change. That is your uh, local garbage employee, your local sanitary employee, they were telling a lobbyist who is helping them that they are working every day and they see people who are texting and driving who may almost hit them. They were close to it. And so they want to see this change as well. They were having some serious problems with their employees being injured. So they would hop off the back of the trucks, they would go and get the, the uh, container and they would go back to the trucks and so many of them were starting to get hit or almost hit by people texting while they were driving. So it became a big focus nationally. These employees are talking to her and saying, look, we want to feel safe when we are going out there to work. And uh, two or three time, different times today, I was told when I asked the question, how do you feel about these proposed bills that are going, when you're going into this new session, you haven't had luck in the past, how do you feel now? The one word that I continue to hear, two words, if you will, cautiously optimistic, Matt. So they say, you know what? It may have failed in the past, but we're going to try again. And if it doesn't work this time, we're going to try again. So this isn't going to disappear, Matt. Uh, no, it is not, Vanessa. And I'm curious, a lot of people ask, is this a partisan issue? Is there a divide down the middle between Democrats and Republicans? Because many states have enacted strict texting and driving laws, red states and blue states, but Florida appears to be different, right? That's right. And, you know, it, it goes into that whole political factor. You have people like Senator Bobby Powell who said, you know, I'm all about traffic safety. He said, I have, he said, I'm one of maybe only the only person who in the 160 plus uh, lawmakers in this area that I have a magnet on my car that said, don't text and drive. So I think it gets into more of, a, if you will, the political game of it and that aspect. And I, it's hard to imagine somebody who said, well, I don't want to save a life. But you get into the political game of it, if you will, and all of the little technicalities that go into these bills and what amendments do we have to do for this group? And if we do the amendments for this group, well, then is it offsetting this other group? So it's, it's kind of a game of chess, if you will. Yeah. And just one more question for you, Vanessa. I know when I got into this, I was thinking this is going to be easy. This is obvious common sense legislation. And then uh, me as a rookie into this uh, got hit in the face really quickly. I'm curious as you just kind of taking this on uh, today and talking with these lawmakers, were you surprised at how much friction there's going to be to get something passed? Yes and no. Uh, and I say that because uh, before I came here to Florida, I was in Alabama and would go to the state capitol there and did a lot of uh, reporting with the city council. And there's 
always friction somewhere. And it can be the most minute thing or it can be a major thing like texting and driving. So uh, no, I'm not surprised in that aspect. Yes, I am surprised because as some people were saying, it seems like it would be a no-brainer. When you are out on the road, whether you have children or loved ones, everybody has a loved one on the road, right? So when you see somebody texting and driving, you would think, hey, let's not do that. Let's have a stricter penalty to that. So it's, it's one of those, there's a great answer, if you will. And that's what we're finding all over the place. Vanessa Ariza reporting live for us in Tallahassee. Thank you very much. And just a little later in this hour, we will hear from one state lawmaker who is against toughening up the texting and driving laws. Vanessa just talked about them. Uh, and he was honest with us on camera. And we'll also talk live to two lawmakers in Tallahassee who are sponsoring bills to toughen the laws up right now. And they're going to tell us about the challenges they face and why they did it in the first place. We're looking forward to hearing from them. So I want to get to our panel now. They have been sitting here waiting patiently uh, with us. And I want to start with uh, Chief Jeffrey Chudnow uh, from Oviedo. And I want to talk about the current law we have in place because some lawmakers say, hey, this law is enough. It does everything we need. Can you explain to me why you feel differently? Well, as you expressed earlier, it's a secondary offense. If an officer sees somebody texting, as long as the car's going straight at the time they see it, they can't stop them because there's not another violation. Mm -hmm. And if, the, if they do, uh, are driving too slow or, 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 or weave in the lanes and they can show that they're texting, it's a $20 fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Nothing that's going to hit the wallet hard. Uh, Brett, what would you like to see? Uh, the law that, uh, that our two lawmakers we're talking to have put forward, uh, it, honestly, it's not the strongest law. The fine stays the same. It doesn't add felony charges if someone's killed. What would you like to see happen with these laws? What I'd like to see the law address is distracted driving in general. While texting is bad because it affects your cognitive, your motor skills, um, distracted driving injury. We've had people that are changing clothes while they're driving, eating hamburgers. We had a fatality in Winter Park from a young lady who was drinking a milkshake and was distracted by that. And something like that is far easier for an officer to uh, testify to than that someone was texting. If someone said, I picked up my phone and was looking at the navigation, that's distracted driving, it's not texting and driving. So if it dealt with distracted driving in general, uh, I think that it would be much easier to enforce for the law enforcement officers out in the field. Mm -hmm. and, and that, but that does complicate things even more politically uh, when we talk to those lawmakers. It, it does, and it needs to be a primary offense. As uh, Chief Chudnow said, uh, I think that those who bring up uh, targeting uh, specific groups are bringing up red herrings for other reasons because years ago when seatbelt wearing was a secondary offense it was not always something we could pull someone over for either and uh, eventually it came around but there was no cry when the seatbelt law was moved to a primary offense that we were illegally targeting anybody uh, or treating anybody with disparate treatment because of that primary change. I don't think you see it in other states. You won't see it in Florida. Uh, and there was even pushback with our drunk driving laws that we have today. So it's Absolutely. always going to happen. And I just want to touch on, I don't know if we can take a shot of the audience. How many people have been driving down the road and you have seen someone reading? <laughs> yeah, look, isn't that crazy? I just saw, like, three weeks ago, I saw a guy reading a magazine on the road. I, I just, I don't know, I just, well, we got an audience, so we might as well, you know, ask you guys. Uh, Kim Montez. You're the Florida Highway Patrol. Now, you patrol highways. You would think people would never be texting while driving 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. You know, my guys tell me routinely that they see it all the time. I see it at patrolling our roadways. And it's a challenge for us to get that person pulled over, as the other two chiefs have said, unless they're committing a violation, running a red light, running a stop sign, weaving, driving too slow, we can't stop them. All we can do is try and get their attention. They see us in a marked car and hopefully they put that phone down. But a lot of times, that's that one time, they're gonna go right back to it. And we have had crashes where we've pulled the phones out of the dead person's hand that's been driving. And we know they've been texting. The numbers are gonna be underreported for crash Absolutely. stats. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, 
We have to be able to prove it before we put it on a crash report, as you have seen personally. Yeah. We know there are way more crashes occurring out there that are because of texting and driving and distracted driving, but because we're not able to articulate and prove it, those numbers are unreported. We know more people are dying on the roads because of distracted and texting and driving. Yeah, and, and because those numbers aren't there, many of the politicians yep. say, well, we don't have reliable information. It's not that bad. Yeah, look at the numbers. Right. They're not that bad. Right. Are you surprised? Do you know any police officers, deputies, troopers who think, nah, these texting and driving laws are fine? No, because I know what our challenges are and the frustration that we feel in, in trying to enforce this law. You know, the crash report was changed several years ago specifically for this so that we could track distracted driving, all distractions. And again, it's just underreported. So maybe those people that are making the decisions to change our laws are looking at the numbers and not seeing what's really going on out there. But all law enforcement's frustrated. It's a secondary violation and our hands are tied sometimes. Yeah, and even the numbers that are watered down are still pretty big. I mean, right. a lot of crashes that they can point directly to distracted driving. Uh, Glenn Victor with the Safety Council, thank you so much for stopping in too. Oddly enough, first time we met was a texting and driving story years ago, long before any of this came up. And, and it was interesting because you had me on a road course texting while going around cones and, and everything else. Compare texting and driving for me to drunk driving, say? Well, that's a great question, Matt. And yeah, I remember that. Uh, we set up an obstacle course. It was a non-scientific study, sure. but it certainly proved the point. Uh, what we had Matt do was try to send a text message as he drove in and out of cones we had set up out in a big parking lot, and he wasn't able to do it. Uh, we've seen study after study about this, and now we are seeing reports and studies that show distracted driving, uh, texting while driving is, if not as much, more dangerous than driving under the influence. Uh, as was mentioned, it affects our cognitive uh, thinking, uh, the physical component to it. So uh, certainly there's a good comparison there. Uh, yeah. You bring up a good point. Mm -hmm. Alex, what can we do about this? You know, where are we at in this fight in Florida? Well, it's all about education and getting people to realize that their behavior has an impact on other people. Mm -hmm. What we really want is everyone to acknowledge their, their own behavior and try and change the way that they drive instead of focusing solely on other people. It's in your hands, that cell phone, so, or the device, or distracted driving in general. So you should try and focus on the actual task of driving. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, let me be completely honest. Before all this happened to me, I have texted and driven. And you know what the stupid thing that went through my mind was? And I hate even saying it now, but I feel like I need to be honest. I'm just a better driver than most people. I can handle it. Is it isn't that the most common Absolutely. kind of issue? We all just think we're good enough to be able to handle this? I, don't, I mean, in, in the, for the individuals that take our programs, we always hear that uh, everyone else is the problem not me, mm -hmm. yet they're in a driver improvement program. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're there. That's why you're there, yeah. exactly. And, and, and Glenn, I know you guys deal with a lot of kids. Uh, yeah. I mean, these kids are attached to their phones these days. How are we to expect them, with no real law to stop them, to stay off of their phones while they're driving? Absolutely, uh, that is why it's so important for us as parents, adults, to set that good example. Uh, you know, it was talked about with the seat belts. It's the same thing when we, you know, we're pushing for the primary seatbelt law. A lot of us back in them days didn't wear a seatbelt all the time, and uh, you know, you wanted to be that good example, so we all start wearing them all the time. And it's the same thing with the cell phones. We need to turn it off and put it out of reach when we get in the car. That way it's just not an issue, so we set that good example for our young people. And there are numbers out there for the seatbelts that are staggering. The first year they put in the seatbelt laws, uh, there were tens of thousands of people being arrested. The numbers have dropped significantly. I mean, that's a that's a fact. It, it's proven. So yeah. it is likely that uh, texting and driving laws would do the same thing. I'd like to take a Facebook Live question. We are live on Facebook. To all of you on Facebook, hey, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, and it's a great question. What about law enforcement? Should we consult other states on what has worked for them and how could we enforce it? Uh, Brett, you know, a lot of people tell me, hey, there are going to be a lot more tickets. It's going to be a lot more for departments to handle. Uh, would you guys be able to handle it? Well, there's going to be a lot more traffic stops. There's yeah. going to be a lot more traffic stops, not necessarily citations, and that's a misnomer. Most people think that everybody that gets stopped by a law enforcement officer is getting a citation. 
uh, we stop people to stop the errant driving behavior. And some violations deserve a citation and end up in a citation, some don't. And it's the officer's discretion at that point. But we do consult other states, and other states say, let's, uh, let's go with the primary laws. And the primary laws are working in other states, and they can work here. Uh, that's what's been proven successful. It's like turning a battleship around when you try and change people's behavior. The same way with the safety belts, we had to take a long time, an education uh, component and then an enforcement component. We don't like enforcement to be the first option. Uh, education and then enforcement. And that's worked in other states with other issues. It's worked in other states with texting and driving. It'll work in Florida. Yeah. Chief, uh, when, you've, when you've looked at this, I know you've been dealing with the legislative side of this for a while. Are you surprised at how much blowback there is when you try to get legislation like this passed? In one way, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're talking about lives on the road. And like you had said earlier, we all have loved ones on the road. Uh, but when I look at it, and, and I have to agree with Chief Raley, it, it's the distracted driving as a whole. Uh, I've seen uh, guys shaving, women putting ma eye makeup on while the car's in motion, uh, reading, and it, it's, it's not just the texting, it's reading your emails. Uh, yes. You, get you can get distracted by having someone in a car and having a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Kids in the back seat. It's also that, and you had mentioned with the phones, people now want to be connected. Uh, they're on Facebook all the time. Everybody needs to know everything now. So it's also that change in culture, and when you get into that car, to put that phone away. Yeah. And I'll tell you as a personal note, I've stopped texting and driving in my car. Don't even acknowledge it. And I'll tell you what, it's kind of nice. You know, yeah, you don't have to just kind of unplug from the world, and it's a, it is a nice change in this world today. Well, since we have started our driving change push, we have heard from people who really feel strongly about this. In November, I spoke to one man who survived a crash on the O'Galley Causeway, and now his mom is joining our fight to drive change. Shrimping, I moved from the west end of the bridge, more up towards the middle. I was talking to one of the regular shrimpers, and uh. Next thing I knew, they were asking me at 4 a.m. if I knew where I was. I guess I got spit out from under the truck. Both of us didn't, thrown into the wall. Got set on fire, thrown into the concrete wall. Jeff Van Reenen and 24-year-old Garrett Vaccaro were both run over by a distracted driver who looked down at his phone to check a text message. A third man, 25-year-old Justin Mitchell, was also hit and thrown off the bridge. Both Vaccaro and Mitchell died at the scene. I think I was numb for a few days. Uh, I think it took a couple days to actually sink in that my son was still safe, but two men had died. But Jeff's mother holds no grudge against the driver who caused the accident. There are people who are very remorseful and realize their mistakes. Marie Van Reenen says in an always connected world, people simply can't put down their phones. Texting and driving. It's just become a habit to them and that's just the way their life is right now. You can't get a millennial to call you back. They do everything by text and it's sort of an addiction and when you get in the car it doesn't stop. Florida State Senator Thad Altman is an advocate for safer driving laws. Texting, there's no, no reason whatsoever anyone should be texting anytime while driving a vehicle. According to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, in 2014, more than 3,000 people were killed in the U.S. and more than 430,000 were hurt in crashes involving distracted drivers. At any given moment during daylight hours, the NHTSA estimates about 660,000 people are driving and using their phones. Texting is the very worst form of distraction because you're literally taking your eye off the road to read a test or to type a text. Jeff Van Reenen believes the simplest solution is to just put your phone away. Wait till you get to where you're going because chances are you're going to be at your location within a half an hour anyway. It killed two people, almost killed me, that or pull over. And his mom's advice? Stop. You could kill someone and ruin your life at the same time. Well, I am glad to announce that we have Jeff Van Reenen joining us right now in the studio. He's a member of our audience. Jeff, First off, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, and thank you for being You're here welcome, tonight. Matt. 
Um, so tell us, uh, well, first off, how you doing since all of this? Uh, do you have lasting effects, or are you pretty, pretty much recovered? pretty good recovered? most days. You know, the lower back pain comes and goes. Usually don't work more than three or four hours at a time before I start to feel it. Yeah. Well, well that's still an impact all these years later. Oh, yeah. For sure. Definitely. Do you feel like the punishment fits the crime in the state of Florida if someone hits and kills or injures because of t distract distracted driving or texting? No, well, it's nowhere close. I mean, like you said, there's 40 other states with, you know, charges for if you were to kill somebody and there's like nothing here. I mean, $30 fine, just about anybody can come up with that amount of money. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Does it make you angry, especially uh, considering what you yes, were involved? Yes, and you know, this is probably wrong. I've actually been on the road before and I've seen all the kids and people texting and driving and usually when I put my horn on, which is very loud at Mercury Grand Marquis, and if I happen to, you know, end up along the light by him or whatever, I'm the one getting flicked off and getting the dirty looks. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I was almost killed, it's like, I'm the bad guy. Yeah. Like, seriously? Mm -hmm. And they just want to flick me off and act like it's no big deal because that's like, like uh, what the officer over here said. I believe it was, sorry, I forgot your name. Uh -huh. um, Brett Rayleigh? Yeah, Brett said, you know, it's like the whole distracted thing and it's just what the kids know now, what a lot of people know. Mm -hmm. It's just, oh, I got to respond to this text. Got to yeah. do it. You know. uh, it does seem to be the urgent thing that no one can uh, seem to avoid these days. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. We appreciate okay. having you here. Uh, I know you took time out of your schedule to come here, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, man. Uh, we got a, another good question on our Facebook Live post. This is uh, one of our in guys here, Glenn and Alex. It says, should a hotline be established uh, to call and report others texting and driving? I don't know if that would even help us with our current laws at this point. Glenn? Well, we currently encourage the students in our classes, if they see a car weaving down the road or speeding at a, you know, a high rate of speed, uh, to pull over and dial star FHP and uh, report, hey, we just saw what we think was a drunk driver at such and such location, and dispatch can send someone out to try to get that driver off the road. So I think this is a great conversation to have uh, about potentially reporting yeah. something like that. What do you think, Kim? We had a hotline years ago for child restraint violations. When somebody would see a child unrestrained in the vehicle, they could call a hotline. That tag number would be sent educational material. Um, but it's very challenging for law enforcement unless they witness that act being committed um, to issue that citation. Uh, but at one time we did have this for child restraints and it was very effective because they would receive educational information about they were observed with a child unrestrained so that's always a potential to have this happen if somebody was observed texting. All right, very interesting. Uh, thank you, Kim. Well, texting from behind the wheel is bad enough, but it's even worse when drivers are doing it in a school zone. Now, in November, we heard from someone on the front line and a state senator who says Florida lawmakers sometimes just can't even vote on their own laws. To students from Southwest Middle School. Have a good weekend. This. Thank you. Is Joanne Howell's turf at the intersection of Malabar Road and Eldron Boulevard in Palm Bay. You're going to have to hurry. Joanne has worked as a crossing guard for the last two years. You're safe, honey. But like many others in this community. But people are texting and driving and texting and driving. Joanne is worried. And it's worse and worse and worse every year. Did you see Joanne just point to a car? She did it three times for News 6 in less than 15 seconds. Joanne was pointing out different drivers looking at their phones while speeding along this busy stretch of road, right through the intersection used by her kids. I believe uh, texting and driving is, is, is just as dangerous and in some cases more dangerous than the DUI. Palm Bay Police Chief Mark Rankin says texting from behind the wheel distracts drivers from their primary task safely driving a car. You shouldn't be texting at all when you're driving, period, whether you're in a school zone or not. Howell thinks the fault with Florida's nonchalant attitude toward texting and driving lies squarely on the shoulders of state politicians. As a secondary offense, cops can't pull you over unless they see you breaking another law. It's a very bad situation. It's one that's gonna to continue to get worse unless lawmakers crack down and say, yeah, okay, 
I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore and we need to put a stop to this. My bill would have made it a primary offense if you're texting and driving to protect the life and protect the safety of our children. In both 2015 and 2016, State Senator Geraldine Thompson had school zone texting bills die in committee, never reaching the House floor for a vote. So many times bills do not come out of committee. Uh, many times they're not even placed on the agenda because you have have a group of individuals from various places, could be business, that are opposed to it and convince the chair not to put it on the agenda. Texting and driving needs to be a primary offense with a big ticket to it, a big uh, dollar fee attached to it, and maybe even community service along with it. It's there, Too many people have been maimed and mutilated and killed. It's not worth it. I think we might need her on Capitol Hill here. Crossing guard Joanne Howell joins us now live in our audience. Joanne, thank you so much for being here and for telling us what you go through every day. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, just, I'm getting very passionate about this. Uh, well, you know, it, once it affects you, once you see it right in front of you, it is so hard not to get involved. Well, so tell us, how much do you see it in front of you? Say, say in a week, what would you? I would say 75% of the cars that pass me on the corner. They're 75 percent easily easily in the and this is in a school zone correct? um my corner is not a school zone but i do do school zones also okay and we have parents that are coming in with their children and they're texting or they're talking they're missing a golden opportunity to have conversations with their children mm -hmm. they really are and that's another reason it needs to stop besides the fact somebody's going to get killed these children they don't pay attention yeah. And even with us as crossing guards, it's very difficult for us to rein them in some days. They're just going to go happy-go-lucky. They're not going to stop to think, i got to make sure these cars are actually stopping. Oh, i got a crossing guard to do that for me. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had guards hit. And not just from texting and driving, but because the drivers aren't paying attention. Yeah. They're, they're, there's a big yellow person standing in front of them. They don't see them. There can only be one reason, right? You're not looking ahead of you. Exactly. We stand out there. We blow our whistle. We're looking around. We've got the big stop sign. We look like little minions. <laughs> you know, it's, you've got to see us. Yeah. We're there. The, the texting and driving, the talking and driving, and I think even people are even playing games on their phones. Yes. Sometimes. And there was a lady this morning was about 15 feet behind the line at the red light. And she's on her phone and she's looking and she's looking and she's looking and then somebody behind her blasts on their horn because she'd been sitting there and the light's been green. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go now. Say a lawmaker's watching this right now. From your perspective, talk to them. Please institute this legislation. Mm -hmm. Please. And I don't think minorities are going to be affected. Everybody is affected by this. Everybody. Young, old, black, white, it does not matter. Our young people are learning by watching their parents and other people texting and driving, talking and driving. They're learning this is the way to do it. I work with junior high students. They're trying to text and talk on the phone while they're crossing the street. We've gotten to the point we have to make them put their phones away as soon as they come up to the corner. Mm -hmm. This is what our children, our children learn what they see, they learn what they live, and this is what they're learning. We will have more and more drivers out there that will continually use their phones and create more problems in the long run. Unless there's a stiff penalty associated with it. Tell Points. you what, I don't know too many people who will look at their phone to check a text message if they're going to have to pay $150, $200. Get points on your do license. So, and get a point on your license, absolutely. Joanne, yes. thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you very much. And uh, we really appreciated Pleasure. your stories. Thank you so much. We are joined right now live uh, by State Representatives Emily Slosberg of Boca Raton and Richard Stark of Weston. They have filed legislation together that would make texting and driving a primary offense. This is exactly what we've been talking about. It would add enhanced penalties for texting and driving in school zones and at school crossings like we were just talking about. Richard, Emily, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hey, glad to have you guys. Hopefully, hopefully they can hear me. Uh, so Richard, first off, 
tell us uh, what the chances are of this bill that you guys have filed getting passed by the state house and becoming law here in Florida. Well, I, I, I keep I, I keep saying the same thing, which is slim and none. I know that uh, some people have thinking that there's going to be a better outcome. Uh, I'm with uh, Representative Slosberg, who is, I like them when they're young and they're gung-ho and they've got a reason to get this bill passed. And I know I've got a great partner in trying to get this passed this year. Uh, but as you can see, we have a doubling of fines within a school zone. I ran the bill last year as a standalone and could not get it heard. I'm hoping for a better outcome this year, but you know that the penalty for texting in a school zone is practically nothing. I think it's $30, so if we double it, it's only 60 and there's no points on your license. And Richard, from what I understand, a uh, year ago in 2016, there was a bill that would make it a primary offense to text and drive in a school zone. But that bill was never even voted on by the State House, never saw the light of day, never got out of committee. Why is that? Well, it seems to be the same thing that we've been hearing for many years, and that it's an intrusion into your privacy while you're in your vehicle. I've also had it stated to me that with all sorts of new technology, there will be a way to stop people from texting in their cars. But as with all technology, it can be overridden if there are no mandates for that technology to be used. So what's the use of it if people are going to want to text anyway? You need penalties. Yeah, and the level of privacy in your car, you're not allowed to have dark tent. You're not allowed to drink and drive. Why you should be allowed to text and drive like this is some privileged right we all get. Uh, makes no sense to me. Before I get on my soapbox, let's go over to Emily. Emily, you are uh, brand new to the House. Uh, congratulations on getting in there and getting this bill, uh, hopefully it at least heard. Now that you're there and you're seeing maybe some of the friction you're going to face, what are your thoughts? I'm hopeful that we're going to move somewhere in the process. I mean, let's face it, we have an epidemic on our roads. Florida has over 39,000 people that are injured last year from distracted driving. It's common sense. I think we're only one of six states that doesn't have a primary enforcement on the books. I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get this through. With Rep, me and Rep Stark and I are going to work hard to get this bill passed. All right, I can see the difference between uh, a freshman and the, the elder statesman. Uh, he's not quite as hopeful as you are, uh, but, but we're all hoping with you. And, and I must say, this bill, I've read through it, uh, and while it does take Florida laws a step further, it doesn't necessarily get us where other states are still. Utah, $750 fine. Alaska, $1,000 fine. Many other states will punish you if you kill someone while you're texting and driving. This bill does not do that. Are, are we headed there someday? Why, why not put that in? That's a great question. This, I, I guess it's starting out with small bites of the apple. And right now, 70%, 70% of Floridians support a primary ban on texting while, while driving. It's time for us to pass legislation that reflects 70% of the state of Florida. Yeah, if I could chime in here, it was difficult to get a bill passed just to begin with. And this goes back three or four sessions ago. Florida had no law against texting while driving. And even at the last minute, there were attempts to scuttle this bill and make it unpalatable so that our companions over in the Senate would not pass it. But they did. And what, what happened with that bill was language that was put in that police cannot look at your phone records to see if you were texting. So that would be another thing that we actually have to get out of that bill eventually. But uh, thank you, Representative Slosberg. I think you're going to be great in trying to get this thing through. <laughs> All right. I love it, guys. Uh, so uh, and it, we have seen interesting things as well delving into this that, that we were surprised by. Um, while most uh, people opposed to these toughening laws are more on the conservative side, like we've spoke about before, they don't want more laws intruding on themselves. Uh, there's also a contingent like State Representative Bobby Powell, who is a Democrat, and uh, he says this particular bill 
would just give uh, law enforcement another reason to pull over a minority. He's a member of the Black Caucus. Let's listen to what he has to say. What do you say to those people who have had loved ones who have died as a result of texting and driving, who say, this is a no-brainer? What do you say to the parents or the sisters or the cousins or the grandmothers who say, this could have been prevented? Well, I think that's a good question. And it's a good, the way you framed it is, what do you say to those parents? I would respond to that like this. We've created many laws here in the state of Florida. And I live in Palm Beach County. There's a homicide that happened on Chillingworth Street last night, Chillingworth Avenue. And we have gun legislation on the books. Because we've created laws, laws has not prevented someone from taking an activity or doing an activity. Okay, so we see his reasoning uh, for fighting against this bill. I want to go back out to Emily Slosberg. Emily, what do you say to that? I, don't, I want to say when the first year that the seatbelt law went from secondary to primary in Palm Beach County, there were 40,000 citations issued. Last year, there was under 10,000 citations issued, meaning primary enforcement of the seatbelt law creates compliance. It forces compliance. So taking that over a step to the no texting while driving bill, making it a primary offense will create compliance with the law 100%. All right, those are, those are really good numbers. Uh, I mean, that is a drastic, and that's in under 10 years because we Huge. were way behind in changing seatbelt laws as well uh, for some reason. So, um, Emily, now, Mr. Powell, he is a member of your own party. He's a Democrat. Uh, are you having any success? It sounds like you're going to have to go convince quite a few Republicans to get interested in this. Correct. I, I do. I have a lot of respect for Senator Powell, and I'm going to have have to sit down with him and have have a chat and uh, try to get somewhere and negotiate with uh, this bill. Yeah, Matt, can I chime in on this? Yeah, absolutely, Richard, go ahead. Uh, I am working, and I spoke to uh, Representative Slosberg about this before, uh, but there are some people, I have to, it's behind the scenes that we're looking at possible language into this bill, if we can get it heard, to amend it on that might help some of the concerns from the Black Caucus. I really can't speak more about it, but these are some of the things. I mean, we're really looking into every angle and trying to get everybody on board with this bill that's so important for our public safety. So there, there are some things going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and the, the Black Caucus is very important. It represents half of the Democrats in the House, uh, almost half, I should say. And I want to talk to our panel, especially our law enforcement, yeah. about that particular question in just a moment. Representatives Richard Stark, Emily Slosberg, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. I know you're very busy there in Tallahassee. And, uh, you know, nose to the grindstone. All right, let's do this thing, we believe. Okay? Good luck. <laughs> thank you so much. Use that Thanks positivity. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys. Thank it's our you pleasure. So much. Well, certainly one of the most moving stories that we have shared so far came in December. It was a woman killed by someone who reached for a cell phone while they were driving. Some of the images you're about to see, pretty graphic. I um, lost my mother to a automobile accident. She was killed by a 19 year old who lost control of his vehicle while trying to get a hold of his phone out of the floorboard. One year ago, Marsha Waldron's mom, 76 year old Martha Jackson died in Polk County while driving back to Avon Park. There's a certain amount of time it takes her to get to my grandmother's house and she normally calls us when she gets here and starts unloading. Martha Jackson's Toyota Corolla was hit head on by a Ford F-250 driven by this man, Daniel Lightsey. According to the Florida Highway Patrol, Lightsey said he had dropped his cell phone and while reaching for it, lost control of the huge pickup. He spun back through the northbound lane, going through the median, ending up in the southbound lane, uh, landing on top of my mother's car. This is the aftermath of that accident. One person dead, two vehicles mangled with the Corolla unrecognizable. The airbags and safety equipment of the 2,800 pound Toyota was no match for the 6,000 pound 4x4. To me, there was no difference in causing a death from reaching in the floorboard for your phone versus a DUI. For Marcia and her sister, 
The pain of their loss was further intensified when during sentencing, the judge failed to notice Leitze was responsible for their mother's death. Leitze, who was only charged with careless driving, was given a $164 fine. My sister sent letters to the judge and the clerk of the court who did that hearing, and both of which said they had no idea. But all over the police officer's accident report had with a death involved, with the death of my mother. When the judge resentenced Leitze, the final outcome still didn't seem very fair to the family. Leitze's license was suspended for six months. He was fined an additional $1,000 and was ordered to perform 120 hours of community service in a trauma center. He still has a life. And my mother lost hers at 76. And as my grandmother gets ready to turn 101, we have a little longevity in our family. And he took that away from her. So as of December, we looked into this, Daniel Leitze had not started any of his mandatory community service, has not made any payments of that $1,100 fine we just told you about. Leitze was also arrested in July of 2016 for knowingly driving with a suspended license. So it doesn't seem like a whole lot has changed there. Marcia Waldron joins us now. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And we are so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, well, we appreciate for coming in uh, this evening. So just kind of tell us, as you watch this and as you've been here this evening, uh, what do you think about these current laws that we're dealing with? I, I really believe that things need to change. And there's got to be different levels in it. I mean, he admitted he Go, he was going down Highway 27, going over 65 miles an hour when he reached into the passenger side floorboard for his cell phone, overcorrected and ended up losing control, going airborne and landing on my mother. And they said, it's just reckless driving. It was an accident and he didn't mean to do it. Um, I'm sorry, if you are driving a car and you lean across and put your head in the floorboard, to get your phone, you have left the responsibility of driving that car and you took full responsibility of taking that life or whatever happened with that car. And I don't care if you're going 25 with children around or 70 going down an interstate highway, there has to be a change in that law. I, I mean, there has to be. If you're not taking responsibility for a vehicle when you're pushing on the gas, then there's no difference in taking a drink and staring at the road, blurry as it may be. You're still taking that responsibility. You know, you got in the car, you started driving, and you took her life. Yeah. People don't mean to kill people no. all the time. That's right. Uh, but many of them still go to jail for it, uh, that's for sure. So that's not a rational uh, reason. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about your mom? We could see the pictures. Uh, she seemed like an amazing lady. Well, we lost our rock. She was, um, at the time, the primary caregiver for her mother, who was 100, and we had to move her from Avon Park, my grandmother, after my mom was killed. But my mom had put her life aside and was living in Avon Park, although her home was here, to help her mother stay in her house because she, you know, that was what we do. You keep your family at home. And unfortunately, the doctor here had her come home for a doctor's appointment and on her way back, her life was taken. And so to continue that, to keep my grandmother out of a assisted living, she came to live with me. Yeah. And unfortunately, I lost her December 28th. Mm. So sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I cannot imagine. Uh, we are so sorry for your loss, but we are thankful that you're here tonight. And hopefully uh, this story that you've told us uh, will help push these legislators to do something. Well, I hope so. And even just, I mean, for what happened to you, if your children would have been in the back seat, I, it would I have know. been a different scenario. Yeah, don't get so. me crying in here, Marcia. Well, All I right. appreciate you. You thank know, you. you saw me and on thank TV you before. for being here. I mean, there's a lot of people who are standing up for it, and I hope that it causes change. I really do. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And uh, I, I do want to send it over to our panel. Does this make sense? Does the Does the... Punishment fit the crime here, Chief Chud. Now, I mean, the, this guy didn't see a second of jail time, and he killed this woman. At times, it, it, it does seem 
not compatible to, to what happens. In, in some respects, if the law looks at, the law looks at, at negligence, so if I run a stoplight, going the speed limit, cause a crash, it may not raise to vehicular manslaughter. Mm -hmm. At other times when you purposely lose that control, when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, it doesn't seem plausible that that type of behavior is not punished, is not punished appropriately, especially when there's a loss of life. Yeah. Brett, what do you think about this? How do you compensate a family for the loss of a loved one? You just can't do it. How do you punish someone sufficiently enough for what they've done? It's a difficult, uh, difficult charge to put on the judiciary, and I'm not making excuses for them. I disagree with them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they have a call to make. Uh, we disagree a lot of times. Uh, I, I can't speak for the specific facts and what the judge took into account in this case, but it seems it seems like yeah. it seems like. Uh, Kim, I, I want to get back to this idea of back to the legislature the, uh, and some of the members of the Black Caucus who said we can't pass a bill like this because this is going to give law enforcement another reason to pull over a minority. How would you address that? You know, being on 23 years. Um, a lot of the challenge sometimes is even being able to see who's in the car, how many is in the car. Um, we're already challenged enough as it is based on window tents, as you mentioned. Um, but when we can see somebody obviously on their phone typing in data, um, which I have personally seen but could do nothing about it because they hadn't broken another law, we want to prevent what happens to her mom. We want to prevent what happens, what we know is going to happen this year. How many people are going to be losing their lives this year? And if we see somebody texting and they've done nothing wrong, we can't stop them. Mm -hmm. We can't stop them and tell them they're doing something wrong and try and change the behavior like Chief talked about. That's our job out there. It's not always the right tickets. We're trying to change a behavior that is dangerous. And that's what our goal is. And we need to get to them before the crash happens. And, and you realize that someone going 55 miles an hour, I know it was 65 in your case, looks at their phone an average of five seconds they've gone the distance of a football field mm -hmm. without seeing the road in front of them it's amazing simple time distance formula the faster they're going the greater that distance is that they've traveled without seeing what's in front of them it's dangerous and and i hope that uh, our comments earlier were not uh, misunderstood we'll take a texting and driving law we'll take whatever we can get yeah. to move incrementally towards a good law it has to be a law that can be enforced though having it on the books and it being unenforceable does no good i would love to see our legislators come ride with us come ride in the next seat next to us and see what we see every day mm -hmm. i mean obviously all of y'all see it you don't have to be a police officer to see the violations occurring but see the challenges that's presented before us and then like chief said maybe that's what the wording ends up so it's enforceable and I would imagine many of these drivers are just young kids, Glenn. Yeah, well, I was even going to say, in addition to doing a ride-along, come sit in some of our classes mm -hmm. over at the Safety Council. As we were talking earlier, we'll do a little informal survey, ask them all to raise their hand, and be honest, how many of you have texted while driving? And you give them a few, and they'll all go up. And then you ask them the question you posed earlier, how many of you are opposed to the current law? How, how many of you would like to see tougher laws? It's more than the 70% that Emily alluded to. Although all of them are admitting to texting at some point while driving, all of them think the law needs to be tougher. So I think, again, if uh, some of our legislators come in and see this in the classes and see what people really want, it can make a difference. It does seem to be a huge divide from what we're seeing on the streets and in the classrooms to what's happening in the legislature, which is kind of the story of our lives, right? It's frustrating. Yeah. It is yeah. frustrating. I would also add that not just ride along, but come to the crash scenes that mm -hmm. we go to. Yeah. 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 See the devastation, not just the the, and not just the damage to the vehicles, but the loss of life and the injuries that occur when someone's driving distractedly. Your driving is basically a 2,000 pound weapon down the road. And how do you not keep control of that? How do you not pay attention when everybody else is around you, you can affect? Yeah.
You know, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Matt, I've, I've taken part in lots of different debates uh, with people who've had opposing views going back to the safety belt law and now, of course, the, you know, the debate over the texting. And, you know, we'll have people say, well, you know, you can't legislate all human behavior. People will talk about what are we going to do, have a law about eating hamburgers or changing the radio. And my response to that is we don't buy it. You can't compare apples to oranges. Yeah. I like the phrase that Emily used. This is an epidemic. For myself, I have a, a you know a young son, early 20s, and I have to remember he doesn't know a world without a smartphone like a lot yeah. of us do. That's just part of his, you know, growing up. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe we can't legislate all human behavior, but we sure the hell can change human behavior. And it takes forums like this and discussions like this to get the ball rolling. And uh, we're just happy you guys did this. Uh, and we've seen laws yeah. change human behavior many times with drunk driving and the seatbelt laws. It's not like going to be the be all to end all. We have the DUI laws, people still drink and drive, but it will be a deterrent. Yeah. And the safety belt law is a prime example. Yeah, yes. It will go down. Yeah, absolutely, Glenn. Uh, I have noticed in our audience, we have a, a young man here, uh, way younger than the rest of us. His name is Mason. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, to Mason. I'd like to talk to you for a second about this. I mean, all you guys know, uh, since growing up, you probably had a cell phone in your hand or an iPad. Uh, the temptation out there is real, right, Mason? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, watching us, watching all us old people in here uh, talk about <laughs> these things, uh, what do you think about it as you've seen? Well, I think that as we've grown up, we've had all of this access to social media and there is that need to be connected to everybody to feel like you're within a circle of friends that you have access to at all times. But I personally think that it's stupid of you to drive and text at the same time. I get at least six hours of free time a day to be connected to my friends. So there's really And no that's time. more than enough, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. So so what do you think as you how old are you, can I ask? I'm fourteen. You're 14 years old. You are a tall 14-year-old. Good grief. Okay. Uh, so when you're not playing basketball and, uh, and you're out there on the roads in two years, I mean, are, let me just straight up ask you, are you going to have the sense and the wherewithal if your phone starts buzzing and beeping to not pick it up? Uh, I would never. It's just not something I would do. That's not the way that I've been taught to treat driving and texting. All right, Mason, thank you so much. We need more of you out there, my friend. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Uh, Alex, I know you guys talk to kids and everybody else a lot. Th that's not a common sight right there, what we just saw. No, it's not. Most people will say in adamantly that they will continue to text and drive, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but just as uh, Mason uh, pointed out, is that it's about teaching them yeah. not to do this particular behavior behind the wheel. And it starts at home. It starts with the people who are teaching you how to drive, whether it's via an instructor or it's, you know, the family member or guardian. Yeah. It's about reinforcing the idea that driving is about driving, not about texting and socializing with your friends. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always considered driving a privilege, yes. not a right, as right. some of these lawmakers, oh, we have this protective mm -hmm. privacy. No, no, no. I have to take a test. I have to be a certain age, and I have to earn the right to be able to drive. Am I wrong, Kim? Your driver's license, when it's issued to you, yeah. it says it is a privilege, it's not a right, it can be taken away, it can be taken away by your parents. Yeah. It can be, if you're under 18, it can be taken away by the state if you don't follow the rules. Okay. Yeah, if, if you have a brake light, people can pull you over, Brett. Absolutely. Or brake light out, I should say. Absolutely, if there's a violation, you can be pulled over, an enforceable <laughs> violation. And that's what we're missing here in Texas. And when you think about it, Matt, you know, with it being a, a secondary offense, it, it sends a message to our young people here uh, to almost, uh, like, it's okay. It's a great point. It's okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a secondary offense. No, we need to know, or need them to know, it's not okay. This is against the law. It's a primary offense. And here's what's going to happen to you if you're pulled over for this, and it's going to be tough. Uh, one of the bigger fines that we uh, heard about earlier. So yeah. uh, definitely sending the wrong message the way it is uh, to the young people. If Chief? It's, if it's working in other states, we can find a way to work, make it work here. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think the excuse that some of those legislatures are having, look at the other states. They're obviously making it work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do we do, Chief? How do, who do we have to push and prod and pull? Lawmakers, right? Well, that's where it ends up at. 
It yeah. ends up in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. uh, is working up in Tallahassee with, with the Florida Police Chiefs Association. Uh, the, the Florida Police Chiefs Association has been trying to get this to be a primary offense for the last five, five to six years. And like the legislators on, we heard from earlier, it gets stopped before committee. Yeah. Uh, you can give every excuse you can that it's going to cause one, one section of our population to get pulled over more. That didn't happen with seatbelts. And there's ways to track that. Mm -hmm. You could even write that into law that it, can be, that it has to be tracked. And she's talking about doing it, that. It, yeah. you know, it has to be tracked and it has mm -hmm. to be reported. That's the easy part. Yeah. It's getting the legislators to, to understand the importance, the safety, not just to the people on the road, but to, 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 to everybody involved. Mm -hmm. it, it has to start and end in Tallahassee. We can compromise it, Chief. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I would just like to say I am both humbled and honored that you all would show up and share your stories and your experiences and, uh, and all the knowledge that you bring to this table. We appreciate it here at News 6. So thank you for watching this News 6 Town Hall report on driving change. We hope you'll join our fight. Call your state representatives and senators and bother them. It can be kind of fun, trust me. And if you've been affected by texting and driving, share your story right on the homepage of clickorlando.com. We appreciate you watching this. I'm Matt Austin.